This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Thank you for all the great content, all the um, the great guest speakers you have on, and for helping me and uh, Gina and I feel fantastic about doing what we're doing. And we'll just keep on listening and uh, take care and uh, wish we could see you all soon and uh, hope that'll be happening. Take care. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to episode 1741, 1741, and thank you for joining me today. A lot going on in the world. As always, China might be having its Lehman Brothers moment as their giant, giant real estate developer Evergrande, is that how you say it? Or Evergrande? People say it differently. May be on the verge of collapse, but is it too big to fail? Will the CCP step in and rescue them? I think they will. What do you think? But what would a rescue look like? Well, (laughs) nothing like in the USA, I'll tell you that. A rescue there of this giant real estate developer that is holding, I don't know how many, the numbers are all over the board on this in my research, but many, 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 many millions of dollars in deposits on properties from people who want to buy their their properties in China and they could lose those deposits if this company fails who knows what i mean it's it's just huge it's probably a too big to fail situation but instead of the uh, well i don't know you know i don't even want to speculate on it i was about to say instead of the crony capitalism in the US what would a rescue look like in China well <laughs> It would look a lot different, but I don't know how much less corrupt or more corrupt it might be. I was about to say that I think it would be a lot more, um, well, I think the government would be aggressive and they would say, look, we'll rescue you, but this is all we're going to pay you, you know, and we're going to demand a big stake of equity because there, of course, you have government ownership of the means of production many times, not always. 1977, things changed quite a bit. But yeah, it'll be interesting to watch this. You know, this is the problem with the media, among other things. There are so many problems with the media, of course. (laughs) But all of the talking heads come out as soon as news breaks. And they just kind of keep talking, but they don't know what they're talking about, right? Because there just isn't, the information is not available yet. So that's what's happening with this situation, like many others. And speaking of news and the media and how biased the media is and how biased the government is and how the Biden administration is using various arms of the government to exert a massive amount of authority, authoritarianism, totalitarianism, and censorship. Look at what is going on at the border. And my friend Bill, who, by the way, is a good friend of mine and probably going to be as famous as some of the big names in news. He was on Tucker Carlson the other day commenting on this story. He's a reporter. He's down there now. And it is just shocking what's going on. But the Biden administration instructed the federal Aviation Association, the FAA, to ground drone flights in the area. Yes, illegal to have drone footage of this. I mean, disgusting. 
unbelievable. I mean, I don't know. Are we living in George Orwell's 1984, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, Hayek's Road to Serfdom, or Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, or <laughs> all of the above, and then some? I mean, it's, it's just absolutely nuts what's going on. But our guest today is Richard Vegg. He is the Secretary of Banking and Securities for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. He has quite a resume. He's the author of a few books, one entitled The Next Economic Disaster, Why It's Coming and How to Avoid It, A Brief History of Doom, 200 Years of Financial Crises, and an Illustrated Business History of the United States. So he will be with us in just a moment. There's one more big thing I want to comment on. Since Gavin Newsom will remain as governor or dictator of the Socialist Republic of California. <laughs> you just can't even make this stuff up. He decided to wield his authority to... Now, you know, I'm not exactly sure I'm 100% against this, but like everything, it will have massive unintended consequences. Basically, as I understand it, he, by just, you know, fiat dictate, changed the zoning of all single-family homes in the entire state of California. Yes. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. You know, listen, you may not know this about me, but I'm really interested in urban planning. I've always found that to be a really interesting topic, the way cities are designed and so forth. You know, there are many people that say, look, you know, you got to get people out of their cars and create more walkable communities. And listen, I agree with that. I love walkable communities. I always try to live in walkable communities when possible. You know, I, I love being able to walk over to the restaurant, to have brunch, to have dinner, you know, if I want to have more than one drink, I can do that because I can simply walk home. And it's quite great. Not that I'm any kind of excessive drinker, but hey, it's just freedom, right? You have the freedom to, to do it without running any risk or hurting anybody, right? Or hurting oneself, obviously. So I just think walkability is a good thing. You know, not very interested in being in cars, but... This should not be forced upon us by the government. It should be a choice. And if the market wants it, heck, the developers will build it. And, eh, you know, I say that, but it's, it's not completely, completely the way it is because it's complicated. Developers have to do something called an assemblage. And they have to assemble commercial land commercially zoned property with residentially zoned property. And that's not always easy to do. Now, on the flip side of this, go to jasonhartman.com and listen to my past podcast episodes, also on holisticsurvival.com, my uh, survival podcast, and type in Agenda 21. Yes, this is a United Nations Agenda 21. And there are some pretty ominous theories about this, that it is designed to pack people into high-density living, small spaces, and so forth. And in doing so, the population can much more easily be controlled, and the population is much more dependent on government. Go back to the Great Depression in the 30s, and you'll notice, how many of you have ever watched the show, the old show, The Waltons? Good night, John boy. Good night, Mary Sue. Good night, Sue Ellen. <laughs> you know, got all these compound names for the girls, right? Anyway, this old show depicted American life during the Great Depression. But what you notice is that the people who suffered the most during that very difficult time in our history were the people that lived in cities because they were dependent on the system. Yet the people who lived in rural America, they were not dependent. They could grow their own food, provide for themselves. So look, the powers that be like it when we are dependent on them, right? If you want to exert control over somebody, make them dependent on you. It is the opposite, ladies and gentlemen, of being an empowered investor. 
That's what we believe in. We believe in empowerment. We want you to become an empowered investor. Yes, you heard it here. <laughs> and that's what our conference was all about just over a week ago, which, by the way, I still have such great memories of that. Thanks to all of you who came out and, and for the just all of the kind words about the conference and how much fun you had, how much you learned. I, I, I'm just was just really, really happy with that event. So we really appreciate all of you. But Gavin Newsom has basically said that all single family homes under this SB9, all single family zoned homes or lots can now be built as duplexes. Okay. So any R1 property, residential one, which means one family, single family, is now considered an R2. Boom. <laughs> Snap of the fingers, stroke of the pen. You know, that's the deal. And he also signed something called SB10, making it easier for cities to approve small apartment buildings in single family neighborhoods. Now, what is this going to do to the value of your single family home? It's not good. Remember this big issue of Obama versus Trump and how Obama said he wanted to bring minority groups into suburbs, right? And he wanted to make suburban housing accessible under, you know, government edict and government programs that would promote affordable housing in like beautiful suburban areas, you know, upper middle class or or even ritzy suburban neighborhoods, right? And Trump said just the opposite. Trump said, look, don't worry. If you live in the suburbs, you will be protected. We're not going to move the inner city into the suburbs, right? You know, there's a lot of debate about all this stuff, right? And it's complicated. You know, the, the thing we've got to do, I mean, there are many things we have to do, right? But we've got to loosen some of the zoning restrictions, but not just the zoning. It's not just the zoning, okay? And and that's what Newsom, who I almost never agree with, by the way, <laughs> is, is, is doing, is he's attacking the zoning with SB9 and SB10. But it, it's the building codes. I mean, the building codes are insane. It is so expensive to build a house nowadays. No developer can build affordable housing. So if you want to fix the inner cities, right? You need jobs for people. You need people to not burn down their own cities and their own neighborhoods, not vandalize them, not riot. Yes, I'm talking to all the folks that burnt down, you know, Minneapolis and Portland and all the rest of the cities, right? Stop doing that because it's like repellent for businesses. No business wants to reopen in these areas. It's too risky. And even if they did, even if they did, the insurance companies won't give them insurance or they will charge them an absolute fortune for insurance. So all of this stuff cuts many directions. But the biggest picture, the macro picture of all of it is to have more jobs and encourage people to work, not pay them to sit home. At least, at least with the New Deal back during the Depression, it wasn't just government welfare, it was government make work, which is a lot better than government welfare, because at least people are building something. And you know what happens when people build something? And I don't necessarily mean a construction project, but I do mean that too. But look, in my job, in your job, even if you don't work with your hands and build things, in quotes, you all build things because you create stuff. I'm creating something right now, right? And when people create something, they have a sense of pride in their life and the direction of their life. They have a sense of empowerment, right? And they, when they are not dependent on government, they feel empowered. They want to contribute. These kind of people don't commit too many crimes. They don't burn down buildings. They want to do productive work and make productive lives for themselves. And that's a good thing. 
So we just got to make sure we're incentivizing the right things. But with Newsom and his SB9 and SB10, it's going to be really interesting to see how this affects real estate values. A lot more to come on this. It's, it's a pretty big deal. And hey, California, for better or worse, most of the time worse, okay, it is a trendsetter. And when these things get out there, some other states start to adopt them and other cities start to adopt them. So you're going to see that spread for better or worse. I'm just saying it's going to spread. It will spread. Okay. Hey, some good news for investors who love financing as much as I do. <laughs> yes, I know that's you. It looks like Remember several months ago, we reported on how Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac tightened the standards on investment properties. And that was bad news for us. That was bad news. And by the way, when I say bad news, like in talking about Newsom and his thing with the, the now every single family lot is suddenly now a duplex lot, right? Can you imagine you got this, you know, multi-million dollar home at the beach. You just built a beautiful custom home there. And then there's a little beach cottage next door to you and it's a tear down. So they tear it down and instead of building another beautiful single family home, they're going to put a duplex on it. That's not going to be great for your multi-million dollar custom home next door. <laughs> I'm just saying. But anyway, everything cuts both ways. There are all these equalizing factors. So when Fannie Mae tightened the standards, and but here's the problem, right? As I've said before, it takes time for this stuff to work its way through the system. So initially when Fannie Mae did this and said, look, every mortgage company can only do a certain amount, a small percentage of their portfolio, 7%, right, in investment property loans. And that's all Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would buy from them. So that was bad, right? Especially for these mortgage companies that do lots of investment property loans, which by the way, that is a specialty. If you need a referral on that, go to jasonhartman.com or call 1-800-HARTMAN. Reach out to our team. Our investment counselors will help you and refer you to lenders who specialize in working with investors. It is a specialty. It's not like the person who did the refinance on your home or the purchase loan on, on your personal residence, right? This is a specialty and you've got to work with mortgage specialist on this. Well, anyway, that would initially, it caused rates to go up and it would limit the number or reduce the number of investors coming into the market. But long term, that might be actually good, right? Because although it would have a somewhat diminishing demand on purchases, it would cause the pool of for rent properties or for lease properties to decline, which would cause upward pressure on rents. Remember, one of the many beautiful things about income property, the most historically proven asset class in the entire world, is that it's multidimensional, as I've taught many times, multidimensional asset class. So you can adjust your strategy. Sometimes your strategy is a capital gains strategy. Price is going up. We all love that. Appreciation. Sometimes it's an income and a yield strategy. Rents going up. And we just sit back and collect our yields. And that's wonderful too. Good ROI or return on investment either way. But guess what? The good news is they are suspending this limit on the acquisition of mortgages from the mortgage companies. So in other words, the secondary market will now not limit the number of investor loans they will buy from the mortgage companies. And this is immediate in the near term, it's great news for investors. So just want you to know that, reach out to our team if you need help with any of this stuff and lots more. We're here to help you do a free portfolio makeover. We are here for you. So reach out to us through jasonhartman.com and let's get to our guest. Let's talk to Richard Vague. Let's talk about his books and some of his fantastic knowledge and then we'll have him back again on Wednesday's episode to finish up on this topic.
It's my pleasure to welcome Richard Vague. He is Secretary of Banking and Securities for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, former managing partner of Gabriel Investments, chair of the Governor's Woods Foundation, and co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Energy Plus. He's got a whole additional business history and resume that we won't go into. He is author of three great books, including The Next Economic Disaster, Why It's Coming and How to Avoid It, A Brief History of Doom, 200 Years of Financial Crises, and the new book, An Illustrated Business History of the United States. Richard, welcome. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. Where are you located specifically? I'm guessing Pennsylvania, but whereabouts? <laughs> Philadelphia. Fantastic. Uh, city of brotherly love. Good stuff. So your new book has got a really interesting title, Business History of the United States. Are we talking about the country as a business or businesses within the country or both B businesses within the country you know the a history of that sort uh strangely enough had never really been written and we were doing some research on financial disasters back in the uh, 1800s and found that a lot of research had never been done about u.s business history so we've tried to remedy that uh, and put something together that folks would enjoy that is pretty amazing give us an overview if you would I, I well, mean, it's amazing that it hasn't been written about. That's yeah, what I mean. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, so we really start in the 1760s and 1770s as you go into the revolution and then bring it up to 2015. We divide American business history into 14 eras. There's a chapter for each. And in each chapter, we tell you who the wealthiest individuals were. We tell you who the biggest business, what the business, biggest businesses were, the key inventions. And then we kind of write a narrative of what happened. And, you know, interestingly for me, as I got into it, it's clear the central business of the United States from the very beginning was real estate. George Washington, as a very young individual in 1748, joins with his brothers and some other Virginians to create a company that tries to acquire 500,000 acres in the Ohio Valley. And that becomes kind of typical of what happens with Patrick Henry and Robert Morris and a number of folks. America is about acquiring big chunks of land and developing those big chunks of land. You know, that's interesting that you say that. And I remember when I first got my real estate license, first year of college at age 19, they initiate you and, you know, the preamble for the National Association of Realtors is under all is land right so land is a very fundamental thing it's really where all resources kind of come or at least all commodities oriented resources come from land if the business of the u.s is real estate would that have been true of all countries at that time and even still or was that different in some way maybe it's because america was so expansive or kind of kind of give us the compared to what on that if you would the great question if you were in some place like england and france the land had already been owned typically by the wealthy families that became the nobles in that countries, and it had been owned for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. So the chance for the average person to come in and amass a land holding was much more limited. So when you go to the United States, of course, it's this discovery of all this very great land, great river systems, very fertile soil that goes on for millions of acres and promises opportunities that are absolutely dazzling to everyone. And, and interestingly, one of the things that happens is that the Appalachian Mountains form kind of a barrier and the colonies have the land to the east of that and want the land to the west of it. They absolutely salivate about the opportunities there, but the British government precludes them from doing that in major uh, pronouncements in 1763 and 1773, this is one of the things that leads to the revolution is Americans are sitting there, how dare you reserve that for somebody else like British nobles, for example. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it's about real estate and the opportunities in the United States are unparalleled. And, you know, this really also is sort of speaks to the foundation of our democratic ideals, right? That the land should be in the hands of the people. It's, it's really, really interesting. And, you know, I don't want to harp on the real estate thing, but you, you started with that. And so much of our audience is interested in real estate investing. I always like to say it's the most historically proven asset class in the world. How is that today? Is the business of America still real estate? <laughs> or, I mean, obviously there yeah, are tech companies I mean, you know, and so forth. We, I would say the answer is absolutely yes. If you look at debt markets, 
the single largest component of the private sector debt mark by far is real estate. It's something like 16 trillion out of 35 trillion. So roughly half of all debt in the United States is about real estate, about 11 trillion in home mortgages, about 5 trillion in commercial real estate debt. So, you know, any way you look at it, real estate is, is the big factor. And, you know, even though commercial real estate right now on, in terms of conventional office space is beleaguered because of COVID, we have areas like server farms, warehouses for internet companies that are continuing right. to grow rapidly. One of the needs we're seeing a lot of recently is with the, with the genetic engineering revolution, we're seeing this massive growth in the need for laboratory space for these very sophisticated companies here in Philadelphia, that's creating a real estate boom all by itself. So, hmm. you know, I don't think the centrality of real estate will ever change. Yeah, that's really interesting. Good stuff. So some highlights as to these different times in businesses, the major discoveries. I mean, I know we got to go through like 240 years, but you started with the real estate and that was a very good point. Any others that sort of really like capture should capture our attention you know when you moved uh, through the 1800s the 800 pound gorilla if you will is the railroad industry right the, the railroad industry is what compels the united states from and also ran to the largest economy in the in the uh, west which we we pass england and france in about 1870 and it's powered by uh, railroads and wherever railroads go real estate speculation and development follows because you know to have a railroad going from here to st louis or chicago you need towns along the way you need farms along the way to grow wheat which you know the transportation of wheat is the big uh, revenue producer of railroads during this period so you know transportation in the 1800s and, and then you see that same big thing happen in the 1900s with uh, the interstate highway system uh, which again is largely about land. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one little tidbit that almost no one thinks about, but the, the Great Depression, it comes on the heels of this massive real estate boom in the 20s. Well, one of the reasons you have a massive real estate boom in the 20s is the automobile all of a sudden makes land available for development that had never been realistic to develop prior to that. Because prior you could that, get to it. Because right. you could get to it. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it, it shrunk the distances and the automobile ultimately, you know, created a very American phenomenon, suburbia, right? That was huge. And it's too bad, though, on the railroad side of it, that the auto companies, I, I mean, I don't know, this is maybe not the exact history, but they just sort of ruined the railroad business, which it would be nice to see a decent amount of railroads today. I mean, the country is so large. It's just too bad we don't have high speed trains and stuff like they do in Europe and Asia you know, America fell in love with the automobile and went that direction. Well, and, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> you know, again, we get back to the, this issue of government support, uh, which, you know, has been critical from time to time. You know, government was involved in the real estate business. It was involved in the development. Of, it financed the Erie Canal and the Transcontinental Railroad. So, you know, government paying a little bit of attention to that could have helped things as well. Uh, you know, I marvel when I go drive, travel the Eurostar between London and Paris, yeah. You know, it's smooth as silk. And, it's great. Yeah. And, and you don't, you really don't find that anymore in the U.S. Yeah, no. And you, and you just have an alternative, you know, driving is just too darn slow. And even, even when the cars become autonomous, they're not going to beat a high speed train and speed. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the speed will double and the packing distance of the highways will increase. So traffic will be virtually eliminated, but even then it's just never going to beat the speed of a train. So, you know, right. it's, it's just that's not, so that, that's too bad. Jumping to maybe one of your other books, the financial crises, when you started writing about that in, well, at least in the book in 2014, what were you thinking then? What was coming and did any of it happen? You know, it kind of, we were probably in for a change in the business cycle, but then COVID happened and massive amounts of money printing, you know, just give us your thoughts on the economy, where we are now, where we might've been had COVID, COVID not happened. Well, you know, after the great uh, financial crisis of 08, 09, et cetera, the debt levels came down and have been relatively flat in the United States 
since then. And when I say flat, I say flat in relationship to GDP, which I think is the correct way to think about these things. And, and so it's been very benign in the United States since then. Uh, it's only begun to percolate in uh, 2019. And then obviously, we've had this massive increase in debt in 2020, which continues to the present. So we're starting to see upward trends that we got to watch carefully now, even though I think the U.S. is in okay shape. The places that, that you have massive accumulation of debt is China. And we're seeing that in things like Evergrande, which, as you know, we're, we're currently worried about defaults. They, they're the largest borrower in the world <laughs> by far, and they're a massive commercial real estate developer. And uh, we're seeing uh, isolated by France has a runaway lending situation right now, in my opinion. And so I think we're okay in the U.S., but if we look around the world, there's several places we need to be worried about. Yeah, you know, I'm really glad you said that, Richard, because I just think that people are far too critical of the U.S. and seem to be a myopic when looking around the rest of the world, and and they just don't ask the question compared to what. I, sure, there's a lot of stuff to be critical for, but I, I mean, with reserve currency status, largest military, debt to GDP lower than Japan, lower than others as well, no demographic problem like China and Japan. China's coming into, Japan has, Russia has, Western Europe has. I think the U.S. kind of has it made, relatively speaking. Am I wrong about that? No, you're exactly right. Yeah, the United States is in relatively good shape compared to the rest of the world. We have plenty of problems, but they're manageable problems. If you look at real estate housing in particular, if you look at the number of houses being built compared to that problematic 05, 06, 07 period, we're far below those levels. Home sales are far below those levels. Mortgage debt levels in ratio to GDP are below those levels. So I don't think there are, you know, you know, we may be, we may be on a path to some problems over the next few years, but nothing of the consequence that we saw at that point in time. I'm bullish on the United States. And the other thing you didn't mention, but I'm, I'm sure you know, is that those that debt is likely far more sustainable for at least two reasons, if not a lot more. The debt is much cheaper than it used to be. So, the, I mean, the interest rates compared to inflation are literally negative interest rates compared to real inflation, I would argue, at least. And also that debt, at least on the real estate side, is extremely well underwritten. I mean, we just don't have a bunch of liars loans and all of the liberal, ridiculous lending we had last time around. So it seems to be pretty solid. I mean, there's a couple of examples where maybe it's not, but they're a drop in the bucket. Right. Well, you're exactly right uh, on both those counts. Real interest rates are very low. Uh, that's a huge factor in the market right now. And then, you know, Dodd Frank uh, made it law that folks had to, lenders had to see that whether there was the ability to repay on a mortgage loan. So that pretty much stopped all of that problematic underwriting behavior. And, uh, you know, as I, as you as you announced at the outset, I'm in the regulatory business at the moment. And, uh, you know, I feel good about what's being done there. And we'll be back with a lot more on this topic with this guest on our next episode. As an income property investor, imagine being able to tap into a nationwide network, actually a worldwide network of investors who share your same challenges and successes. Imagine being able to leverage the experience of experts and learn from their achievements and their mistakes. The Empowered Investor Inner Circle is an exclusive community of like-minded and successful investors who help each other invest smarter and avoid common setbacks and pitfalls. Join us today and take your portfolio to the next level. Level up and learn from the mistakes of others. Level up and effectively self-manage your portfolio. Level up and increase your peace of mind and your profits. Level up and gain greater control. When you join the Empowered Investor Inner Circle, you are joining a network of accomplished, experienced, and knowledgeable investors. Investors who will help you take control of your investments while saving you time and money. Managing a portfolio of income properties in a diverse range of markets across America has never been easier. 
With technology, almost every aspect of income property investing can be done from the comfort of your own home. Join the Empowered Investor Inner Circle for monthly live training sessions with Jason Hartman and special guests to discuss which investment strategies will work the best with your unique life situation and portfolio. Get regular real estate updates and articles so you're in the know and up to date with what's happening in the world of income properties. You will also receive inside access to Jason and his team of investment counselors who will quickly answer any of your questions. Access our Rolodex of vetted resources, including property managers, contractors, plumbers, and electricians, so you know you're getting someone who does high-quality work. Act now, and we'll include one free year of access to Property Tracker, a web-based program that will help you manage your income, expenses, legal documents, contracts, and all contacts associated with administering income properties nationwide. A one-year subscription to Property Tracker costs $347 per year, but if you sign up for the Empowered Investor Inner Circle today, you will receive one year of Property Tracker access for free. Don't let this unique opportunity pass you by. Join the Empowered Investor Inner Circle today. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go Go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Bye.